Welcome to the April 11th episode of MSP Dispatch, your source for news, community events, and commentary in the MSP channel. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Tony Francisco. How are you doing, Tony? Excellent, Ray. How are you doing, my friend? A nice, relaxing weekend and a lot of craziness in the news this morning. Uh, what do you say? Let's get into the news. In news that's taking the MSP world by storm, Kaseya has announced that they will be acquiring Datto. Datto, with over 400 employees worldwide, servicing over 5 million organizations, is the software as a service company that caters to MSPs with backup services, PSA, RMM, and a host of other services. Uh, this announcement, they announced several weeks ago that they were looking for possible sale, and Kaseya seems to be the willing partner to take it. This is huge, Ray. Uh, this is a huge market shift that is destined to affect everyone. Datto is 100% uh, for the MSP, for the channel, and Kaseya is up there as well. Consequently, the merger of the two should result in something very positive, but definitely something that's going to impact the MSP community um, drastically. So uh, I'm interested to see what the next steps are ahead. I'm interested to see what the leadership um, is going to consist of. I'm interested to see if they have any particular vision that maybe we're not able to see right now, or if it's taking the best of both worlds and bringing it all together in a single unified frictionless environment that can have something that will empower the MSP that they're known to be uh, servicing anyway. See, that's that's my concern here. So, you know, Kaseya has VSA, which is their RMM platform. They have BMS, which is their PSA platform. Datto has auto, they have Datto PSA, which is formerly Autotask, formerly Center Stage. And they have Datto RMM, uh, which was Datto's product uh, in the RMM space. And so we're going to have two major companies with two competing platforms in each of the big spaces, PSA and RMM. Then there's the data backup, backupify, and, and so many other products. Um, I'm wondering, you know, is this going to be a winner take all kind of thing of they're going to keep the best in class product? Or are they going to keep all four of these products in play uh, going forward? Uh, there has been varying degrees of interest um, or varying degrees of progress with each of these platforms where you know data has been well known for their very fast rapid development strategy and release strategy uh that was one of the major things when data picked up autotask they increased the development cadence whereas uh kaseya is not really known for new features and new feature releases with products they purchase so i'm wondering how that's going to how those two different types of companies are going to work together when one is very fast and iterative and the other one is a much larger behemoth slower to move um, so i'm very curious about that so ray this could be a microsoft linux uh scenario where microsoft and linux were always considered that oil and water type of relationship they were never possible uh, there, there was never a possibility of the two working together outside of some weird middleware uh translation and eventually what occurred because you had such two loyal audiences to each they merged and that merger is continuing right in front of our very eyes where it is going to have a huge benefit to not just the individual uh, loyal fan bases of each of those sides, but to the community as a whole. So it could be that scenario where uh, Datto, which has an extraordinarily loyal audience, and Kaseya, which also has a very long uh, relationship and, and loyal audience, bring out the best of both of those worlds and they find a way to work together that benefits the community as a whole. And that, that's good. this could be very exciting. Speaking of Microsoft, in the news now, Microsoft plans to increase uh, pricing on the nonprofit cloud products. The research that we've done is preliminary, but we do know that the price increase is going to take place later this year. Uh, this price increase affects quite a few of the nonprofit cloud products, um, and we'll have a link in the show notes for the details that we have currently. Uh, the price increase ranges from 10 to 28%. It does not affect grant products. Um, we're we have mixed emotions about this internally because although that price increase could be devastating in some fashion, it's still a limited product set. And the reality is that Microsoft has not raised a single price for over a decade. So Ray, what are your thoughts about this? Any price increase could be received as something negative. 
However, no price increases for over a decade. The office suite has evolved dramatically during that time. And now there is a price increase that's occurring across the board, both, both on the retail side as well as the nonprofit side. What, what, is your, what is your take on that? I think this is another step we've already seen. Microsoft tried several times last year to re revise the terms of the partnership agreement. They were going to do away with partner uh, action pack. They were going. They changed where partners could no longer use the internal rights software uh, from action pack or from their benefits. Um, both you of know, those and had then they reversed on both impacts. Those. Remember that? That was amazing. Absolutely. The community re recoil of that was fascinating. It was great to see though. <laughs> it, it was great that we got a win, but then we talked about uh, in our first episodes of MSP Dispatch, we talked about the NCE changes and how Microsoft did not go back on those. And those are huge. I mean, those are 20 and 30 percent increases in costs. Um, Microsoft has been significantly added to adding to the stacks. They've been adding what products and features are there, very similar to Amazon Prime, right? The price keeps going up, but they keep adding what's in those Prime subscriptions. Microsoft's been doing the same, and now it's this moment where Microsoft is saying, we've added so much, we need to increase revenue for the value we've added. Uh, and I think this is just that next step, that next iteration, where they're going to those nonprofits and saying, we're going to start recouping those funds too. We're cutting back on, on those major discounts. It's a revenue play. It is. And I think the combination with the uh, new commerce experience that they're implementing a framework that not only um, structures that revenue play, but it captures it as well for, in some cases, uh, quite a long period, depending on the, on the contract term. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Also in Microsoft news, Microsoft is taking credit for stopping Russian connected cyber attacks on Ukraine. And in this particular time, uh, it's well appreciated. It appears that Strontium, uh, also known as Fancy Bear or APT28, those fancy names, uh, known for its connections in the Russian government, launched attacks on media organizations in the Ukraine during the February 24th until now um, invasion of the Ukraine area. Uh, the Microsoft as a whole has been very strong, strongly opinionated in staying out of this. But this is the first time that we're actually seeing some direct involvement and they are taking credit for this action. So, Ray, uh, tell me how you feel about that. We have one side where Microsoft is raising rates on nonprofit services, as we just discussed here. And now on the other side, a more altruistic approach where Microsoft is stopping Russian uh, cyber attacks on the media in the Ukraine area. Um, how do you feel about this? So I, I've... I've always taken the contrarian view that good costs money. Um, we can, you know, with my own organizations in the past, I've always, we've done a lot with charitable giving and, you know, supporting nonprofits and everything else. That can only be done when you have enough revenue to support your initiatives, right? Uh, it's the same reason I'm a firm believer open source should be funded, um, whether it's through professional services, whether it's through um, donations or whatever it needs, but it needs money to do the things they, they want to accomplish. Microsoft, trying to increase revenue has an effect on their ability to do these things where they go back and fight injustice. I'm not saying that Microsoft is Mother Teresa, far you know, far from it, but they do do a lot of good. Uh, and the only way they can do that is if they have the proper revenue sources to, to do so. So what you're saying is that the uh, for everyone who dislikes the revenue hike of nonprofit pricing, um, just remember that subsidized or funded the uh, the the cyber attackers from being stopped. Uh, <laughs> Ukraine media. There you go. We we can pretend there was a direct correlation. There was the, a the correlation <laughs> is is very clear, and I'm glad we we yep. made that for the audience. Uh, <laughs> In examples of vendor accountability, Atlassian Software has disclosed that the reason for their week-long outage that started April 5th at 9.03 UTC is the result of a maintenance script that went bad, and it took down their cloud software. It took down Jira Work Management, Jira Software, Jira Service Management, Confluence, Ops Genie Cloud, Status Page, Atlassian Access, and others. Jira Software is most widely used for project management, software development firms use it worldwide, ticketing software, ops genie status pages. The Elastian status page shows exactly what is still affected and they have been updating it regularly. Tony, this kind of 
this kind of accountability where they're saying, oops, we did it. Uh, this is what's going on and we're still trying to fix it. They've assigned 400 engineers working on this problem and they're communicating quickly. Uh, that shows a, a level, a degree of accountability that we've not we've not often seen in, in our space. Um, Agreed. Are you even, affected even by the, this? Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think everyone's affected in some degree or another. You know, we use it for uh, get repositories um, and, and data data pools from a software developer perspective. So we we were affected. It, it was a very light impact from our side. However, um, it's scary. And uh, having a status page that's being updated in real time is one step ahead of what we consider to be the normal out there. It's uh, the first step of accountability because it's the acknowledgement of and the communication of an issue. Um, you know, finding out the root cause analysis is a new is a new level, but that does that has very little positive uh, bearing on the situation. Uh, but the fact that they have disclosed the amount of resources and engineers that they have working on this, it, that means a lot. And and I'm of the opinion that uh, every apology comes with three very core pillars, the initial uh, and sincere apology, the, um, you know, what can I do to make it better? And the third and final is, yeah, here's what I'm doing to make sure it never happens again. It sounds like we have a first and a third. Um, the what can I do to make it better scenario is a lot of band-aids of, you know, status pages and, and some communications, but one week outage, Painful, just just painful. Uh, but I'm glad they're taking the right steps. They're taking steps in the right direction. Absolutely. This reminds me. Uh, this is reminiscent of the Facebook outage from last October. Um, you know, we it, it was just Facebook, but it, it was basically everyone uh, looked at it as the entire internet went down, or at least that's how our that's how our clients looked at it, right? And that was uh, that was something that was just a I believe it was a zone file update uh, that was done incorrectly and took down DNS because it's always DNS, uh, and that even blocked access to the facilities where they needed to make the changes to get back up. Uh, this happens to the best of them. If you haven't read the postmortem, I'll get the show link uh, or I'll get the link to the story and I'll put it in the show notes below so you can read the postmortem on it. Uh, that was also a very interesting read from an engineering perspective. Uh, definitely something you, you, can, you can only plan for and hope it never happens. And if it does, you test your plans and see what happens. Um, that's a long way to say good job, Atlassian. And <laughs> we're very proud of you. And, and thanks regarding, for giving us away. <laughs> regarding that Facebook outage, I re, I was so upset because I couldn't post the post on Facebook about Facebook being down, and it was really frustrating me. I think that's what frustrated me the most. Uh, no, no. <laughs> when you can't update your Instagram, th then you, you know stuff's coming <laughs> sideways. And, uh, uh, yeah, I'm I'm really glad for Atlant Atlassian to uh, you know keep everyone up to date. The communication is uh, is a critical step. Speaking of Twitter and updates, it turns out that Elon Musk, after his 9.2% uh, purchase of Twitter, making him the largest stakeholder in the Twitter organization, abandoned his plans to join the board in Twitter. That has caused quite a few questions of what are the plans, the vision, the changes that are speculated to be taking place inside Twitter post Musk's uh, involvement in the Twitter organization. I think all this is currently unfolding. This is hot off the press. Uh, the Twitter platform as it exists today is uh, sta standard, standardized. There's no changes uh, anticipated yet, uh, but keep your ears open uh, because I'm pretty sure there's going to be some big news ahead. Silicon Angle has an interesting write-up where they analyze the after effects of the Okta breach going into Okta's response saying that it's a near zero technical impact to their operations and their customers, advising the impact was only to 366 customers worldwide. And the reality that most security researchers believe that is all full of it, for lack of a more, uh, more, pro more professional term. Uh, this is affecting how security researchers, how organizations, how enterprises uh, of all sizes are approaching the vendors that they use 
and the accountability that they expect. We will include the link to their story, the full write-up by Silicon Angle in the show notes. And that's a wrap for this April 11th episode of MSP Dispatch, your source for news, community events, and commentary in the MSP channel. If you have any comments or concerns or questions or articles you want us to cover, go ahead and just hit, hit us up on social media or email news at mspmedia.tv. Tony, thanks so much for your comment and insights. I appreciate you as always. I look forward to seeing you on Friday, man. Thank you, Ray. Everyone have a great one. This has been a broadcast of the MSP Media Network.